Welcome to the Media Navigators podcast, brought to you by the World Media Group. My name's Belinda Barker, and I'm the Chief Executive. Today's podcast may feel a little bit left field. The World Media Group exists um, to promote the values of global award-winning journalism. But also, we... um, are about sharing and learning uh, best practices across the sector. Media marketing is a creative and people-orientated business. This is even more so within the international sector. We have to create programs from the start using different people across different sectors, across different countries. Um, And being able to communicate in in that field is is even more important. So being the best version of yourself and being able to bring out the best in those around you, whether they are staff, colleagues, clients, suppliers, is vitally important. So I'd like to introduce my co-host today, Jemima Villanueva, Uh, Jemima is Executive Director for EMEA at The Atlantic, and she's also one of the board directors of the World Media Group, and my co-host this morning. So, welcome, Jemima. Hi, Belinda. Thanks for asking me to join today. This is very exciting. I have a huge pleasure to introduce Amy Keane. Hi, Amy. Good morning. Hi, hi, hi. Amy, you are someone who has lots of opinions on the marketing and advertising industry and isn't afraid to share them, which is why I am so excited to interview you today. Um, Really sorry to go all fangirly on you, but I do want to give you a proper intro. And I've listened to a few of your podcasts recently, and everybody seems to give you a really long intro. So I know I'm not alone. Um, Apart from knowing you in real life, obviously, and having having worked with you recently, um, I follow you on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and I find your content incredibly uplifting. And and I was looking into why that is, and it's because it is so honest. You're also fiercely funny and incredibly clever. So... um, Audience, I'm just going to turn to the audience for a second here. I'm going to have to apologise in advance. This episode is going to be a little bit sweary. Uh, Of all the World Media Group podcasts, this one will probably have more F-bombs, I guess, than all the others combined. And principally because if we want to talk about Amy's book, The Little Girl Who Gave Zero Fucks, we're going to have to. So Amy... Amy is a best-selling author, and The Little Girl Who Gave Zero Fucks is a brilliant feminist manifesto, but in the guise of a, of a beautifully illustrated children's book. Amy, you're also the editor, the culture editor of Shots magazine. You co-founded DICE, which stands for Diversity and Inclusion in Conferences and Events, and very recently founded your own company. Congratulations. The company is called Six Things Impossible. So I'd love to kick this off uh, with you telling us a little bit about Six Things Impossible, please. I would love to, because I'm in hardcore self-promotional mode at the moment. Also, when you want about the expletives, I thought, how amazing would it be if I just launched right now into... (laughs) Go for it. Like the worst... (laughs) Swear, swear words and phrases. I won't. I'll use them. I'll use them wisely and appropriately when I swear. <laughs> Six things impossible is. I started it last year. Finally got the bravery to in 2020. It's the I call it the creativity and culture company for tomorrow, and it's the company that I always I always wanted to see exist. So I made it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's for those of you who don't know the the quote it's named after a really famous quote in Alice in Wonderland but the book Alice in Wonderland where Alice and the Red Queen are talking and Alice refutes impossibility and Mm. the Red Queen says you can absolutely achieve and believe impossible things you just have to practice Mm -hmm. for example I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast every day and I just love that quote because it's about optimism and open-mindedness and just achieving stuff that everyone else thinks they can't and that's the foundation of my business 
wanting mm-hmm. to do things, lots of different things in brand new ways. So the reason I've done that, just to give you a tiny bit of background, mm-hmm. I worked in advertising for like 16 years, um, primarily senior roles in innovation, in media agencies, creative agencies, PR agencies. And when you work in innovation, inevitably, you end up just wanting to fix things or just wanting to solve problems. And you're look at society and life and products and processes and you always want to make it better Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what I've basically founded my company upon is the desire to make everything better across company culture lack of you know the lack of diversity in our industry collaboration the originality of ideas Um, and so yeah that's me. Wow that sounds very exciting I mean I guess you don't have context for launching a business not in a pandemic, but how has it been launching this business in a a virtual world? Uh, I feel like I've had, I mean, how honest do you want me to be? Do you want me to be honest? How honest should I be? I'll be really honest. You like my honesty, Jemima, I'll be honest. I do. I said that in the intro, so you're right. (laughs) Uh, I had no choice. So right at the beginning of the year, and I think it's actually really important to talk about this because it's a thing that a lot of people go through and they're often too embarrassed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So right at the beginning of 2020, I started a new job. I had really high hopes. It was part of the leadership team. It was an innovation consultancy. And I thought this was going to be the most amazing new chapter in my career. It was horrible. For six months, I had a, you know, my first day was in lockdown. So I never actually had any kind of social dynamic or currency with these people. It was a hideous six months. I felt lonely. I felt isolated. I felt misunderstood. And I was living on my own. So obviously you have that kind of way. And I literally had no choice for my mental health but to leave which looks crap on my CV and I had all of that you know horrible oh but it looked really bad type um but when you know you have to leave you have to leave I, I've been in in situations like, like situations like that over the years and you just it's black and white at one point isn't yeah. it yeah you just know otherwise but the thing is I think so many people I wish people were more honest about it and they talked about it more because I right. probably lost a good three months toing and froing about whether it was the right thing to do mm. perception wise who cares like who cares um mm. anyway so I left after six months and thought oh my god I can't feel any worse mm-hmm. this situation couldn't get any more stressful let's start a business and because of that I've never been I've never been more excited I've never been more motivated because it was about saving myself Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope that wasn't too honest. No, that was amazing. Thank you so much for being so honest. I honestly, I I can't believe that anyone hasn't reached a point at some point in their career where they've had to make a decision based on their mental health. You know, if you sort of laid it all out logically on paper, pros and cons, you could have triple the amount of pros than cons. But the only one glaring con is I cannot do this any longer. It's funny, I I because I've been running my own business now for 20 years but I didn't set out to be entrepreneurial um I I was made redundant um literally when I was having giving birth to my second child um and it was that kind of uh I had two kids under 18 months old and to try and find a, 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 a full-time job within the international sector, which is where I've, I've always worked in international, so traveling a lot, it, it just, it wasn't going to happen. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And so I didn't actually intend to set up a business. I just took on a client and then I took on, somebody else came and there was another client. And then, and then all of a sudden, 20 years later... <laughs> Um, I'm still running running that business so yeah it, 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 there are different ways into it sometimes it just happens to you whether you whether you haven't got a, a cunning plan or not but anyway I'm not not sure I'm recommending I think I suspect having a cunning plan <laughs> is a better way of doing it but you know there are other ways as well sorry Amy we're certainly talking to you I'm, I'm waffling on 
No, no, this is great. I'm a firm believer in the universe. Well, obviously the universe exists. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> believing that. But I think serendipity and things happening for a reason, you have to believe it, surely. I'm disgusted that you got made redundant when you were pregnant with your second child. Yes, these things happen. The world has, has fortunately evolved in 20 years. But, yeah. Well, have you heard of pregnant then screwed the, the body? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so they're suing the government, I think. Yeah, anyway, well, I've got a big fat payout, which actually made the whole setting my, my business up a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Every cloud. <Yes. laughs> anyway, sorry, we've really gone off piece here. So um, I really wanted to talk to you about um, DICE. Um, now, so the World Media Group puts on um, events during the course of the year for the, for the benefit of the industry. And we, we, we cover a whole raft of different thematic um, uh, materials, uh, but trying to get uh, a, a really you know, diverse set of speakers is, is incredibly difficult. And I mean, it horrified me. Um, a few years ago when uh, in a feedback form after an event uh, we got accused of actually being sexist because there had been more men on uh, a panel than than there were women. Um, I always try really hard to get women. I mean, if for every, if, if I approach um, five men and and five women. Uh, one of those women m- might consider speaking. Five out of all five men will all say yes without a, a doubt. So, what I would love to know is is how how can I make it more easy for women to say yes? And also, what are what what should businesses be doing to you know encourage um, the women within their business to to speak out and, and be seen, so that we're not promoting the white <laughs> male. Apologies to white men. I'm not discouraging you. I, I just want like to encourage to apologize more women. to white men. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> um, this is, you know what, this is an area in a conversation that requires a huge amount of honesty and us facing the reality of women plus events. Now, in this age, as women, we always want to, we all want to think that we're a badass. We all want to think that we're powerful, you know, we're empowered, we're strong, etc. But there are some realities based on the research that explain that difference that you talked about, Belinda, the reason why one woman says out of five says yes and five out of five men say yes, women are less confident when it comes to public speaking. That's a statistical fact. There's a study, how weird is this? So you know the museum, Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, Mm -hmm. which I think is closed down now, but they did a research project two or three years ago. They asked... 3,000 women, what they most feared. And what they did was they presented to them 88 fears. So arachnophobia, various different fear of... What's the fear of falling? Ooh, fear of heights. I mean, it's like... Philophobia is the fear of falling in love. Ooh. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. sad. <laughs> Very sad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they presented them... Presented to 3,000 women, 88 fears... Public speaking was number three behind only losing a loved one and being buried alive. Oh, God. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) Across all women, and there's various reasons for that. We worry about being judged. We worry about being perfect and so on. But in addition, it's a society grooming thing. Women are more inclined to need permission to speak, to be asked to present and to know that there is no one else in the whole world that is more qualified than them to present at that event or to sit on that panel. And this is the problem. I've been working in events for years and years and years, probably about 20 years. 
And I know how to ask women properly to speak in an event now. You need to flatter them. You need to research them. You need to reassure them that they are the perfect person. And you need to tell them how much value they're going to add on the panel or on the lineup. And it's so unfortunate that we have to do those things, but we do. A lot of events organisers, in my experience, they churn out events. It's a money-making thing. They rely on their bubbles and they don't want to go to that effort. A lot of events organisers, based on my work that I do with DICE, are lazy. I'm going to say it, they're lazy. Amy, tell us a bit about your your course that you run, because one of the things that I'm really conscious of is that if you impose quotas and, and, and limits on events organisers, you sort of make them feel bad, you sort of push them underground, you make, maybe make them have to postpone an event. If, if you just impose numbers and, and, and judgment on the numbers of men or women on a panel without offering something as a more sort of grassroots solution you're you're not really helping and I know that you run practice makes unperfect Mm -hmm. there's a really really interesting point Jemima because I think I do agree with you I totally agree with you but also I think you have to start somewhere and sometimes you do have to start in that unfortunate numbers game place um I was start just by really quickly explaining what DICE is. Um, DICE stands for diversity and inclusion at conferences and events. Uh, Me and some industry peers within the advertising space noticed exactly what you were saying, Belinda, that all whale, whale, (laughs) male, white men, whales were (laughs) presenting at events. We wanted to do something about it. So we created an educational tool based on the 2010 Equality Act that showed what an inclusive event would look like. This many women consider disabled people, consider different age groups, consider different races and so on. The reason why we created that was because if you're in an event and you look on a stage or a virtual stage and you don't see anyone that looks like you, thinks like you, acts like you, has the same background, then how, why would you feel that you belong in that industry? So to your point, Jemima, we need to try and get a bit of difference on stages first, hence the quotas. Um, So within DICE, we say that no lineup should have more than 50% men. But in reality, it's hard to get those numbers of women. So practice makes on perfect is going a little bit deeper to try and solve the problem rather than merely addressing the representation on stages. So it's a six week course that's designed to help women be more confident, not in public speaking necessarily, but be more confident being themselves on stage because then they'll have fun and they'll be more likely to say yes. So maybe the answer to my previous question is, is that I should recommend that they come on your course. Yeah, well, we've got, there's a new one, there's actually a new one starting on the 27th of January, but it's all booked up. How many people do you um, accept on the course at at a time? So I started, the first time I did it, there was 20, but I think that's actually too many because the really nice thing about the course, for now it's all women, and what you want is like a really nice, safe space where people can try out new things, they can make mistakes. So currently we're between 12 and 15. That feels like quite a nice number. Um, we're also starting this year to do uh, to do the course internally at different organisations for like entire teams because actually you know what I realized there's something about zoom that terrifies people and a lot of people have said to me recently when they've been talking about like stage five and presenting people get really terrified about presenting to their own team members on zoom it's a real thing I don't know the source of the fear because you can only see your head and shoulders but there's just something about it that and you can always present, pretend that your internet connection has gone by freezing your face or going ah, 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 ah. you know that's well, that was my always my, my fallback have you done that? <laughs> no of course not but in the sub, somewhere in the back of my mind there is always that thought <laughs> if it goes terribly wrong I can always pretend my connection is frozen but hey maybe that's just me oh god I did I don't know <laughs> So in there, so at the end of practice makes them perfect. So the wonderful thing about it is that you get practice, practice, as the name suggests. You get to do podcasting, you get to be interviewed, you get to sit on a panel, you get to write a blog, and you get to do a presentation at an event at the end of the course. 
because of COVID and all that jazz, we had to do the event on Zoom. And after I did my introduction, introducing all these amazing women, I got kicked out of Zoom. And so everyone at the event just saw me frozen <laughs> in this weird position where I had my hands up. It was like I was being attacked or something. We'll put it on LinkedIn. I remember, yeah, it was a real kind of... As if you were screaming at the camera a moment. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't intentional because you fluffed your no, lines or anything. It wasn't. Okay, good. Before you leave, can I, if we could just go back a little bit, because you, you talked about um, how to get, uh, how organizers can help encourage more, more women. But if you were thinking about um, one, it, as you know kind of a, a head of a large business what what should they be doing or, or a unit to encourage their staff uh, and secondly just just for women uh the, like uh, including myself or Jemima or, or anybody who who is aware that they don't put themselves forward as much as perhaps they ought to what what would you what top tip would you give them yeah <clears throat> the first question is extremely hard because the narrative of company culture today is primarily lip service I think lots of organizations particularly with, within the advertising space have lovely powerpoint decks that destroy, describe their culture and the authenticity and the honesty and the integrity and all those things that companies are supposed to have but I don't think that learning and development budgets are geared towards bringing the best out of people. The only way you can do this is by encouraging women to be themselves and not a fake, ideal, perfect Stepford CEO person that we all try to be. So in a lot of organisations, you go on a resilience training course or you might go on an unconscious bias training course, but that's all about admitting your flaws and learning what's wrong with you. And I think there needs to be more positivism in training, particularly for women. And again, we need to be honest, women need this training. People of colour need this training. Like, we have to be honest about that. Um, so it's going to take a while. I think perhaps stuff like I, I, I'm totally happy for stuff like practice makes them perfect to pop up all over the place because if it bloody fixes it then great the second thing is and I remember while I was doing this course I can't remember what I was talking about I think I was um I was talking about how it's not that big a deal if things go wrong fuck it you know if you make a mistake if you I trip over my I talk so fast trip over my words all the time if I cared I'd never present ever um so I remember saying to everyone on the course like it doesn't fucking matter who cares what people think of you and I remember everyone on the course saying well it's you know it's easy for you to say and I was like actually it's not <laughs> because well it is now but my journey to today I used to be terrified of public speaking I hypnotized myself when I uh, first started presenting at conferences my face used to shake I used to cry after I presented every single time if I ever did an event and it was painful it was painful every single time but the only way to do it and I know it's easier said than done you have to push yourself you have to throw yourself out there knowing that sometimes it's not gonna it's not gonna go exactly as you wanted but you're I think that's fascinating because, you know, just talking to you, I, I would have assumed that you, you were born a natural speaker. You know, you just, you, you ooze <laughs> um, uh, confidence. And, and so to hear that you, you also struggled and, and worked your way through it gives me, gives me some confidence. I was the worst. I, I don't think anyone, I don't, I, panic attacks, nightmares um I never learned I don't know what I never learned to do public speaking at school and at university I did sociology and it's not really a very presenty I don't know like I'd never really practiced it um but the only thing is and this is what I say to the women on the course because you have to every it's such an emotional drain doing this six-week course because you're constantly dragging yourself out of your comfort zone in front of people that you don't know but you'll always be proud of yourself after you've done it. That's the one thing I can guarantee. You will always be really chuffed that you did it. 
That's brilliant, Amy. I think we're going to have to bring this to an end already, which I absolutely hate because I I would feel like I'd like to chat with you for the entire day. Um, I I mean, yeah, it's it's all about getting yourself outside of your comfort zone. Um, And I think uh, what we should do is put links to some of the resources that you, you were talking about during that so that people can can follow up with this um, and look at the courses that, that Amy was was talking about. Um, I'm trying to think of a really succinct way of signing off. I think go forth and be confident or, or, or something of that nature. But um, I'd just like to thank you both so much for joining me today and um, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much, Jemima and Amy. Pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, Amy. Thanks. You could end with a load of expletives. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Amy, we might even just take out the swear word war- uh, warning because you were disappointingly unsweary in that. So, yeah. <laughs> the word two or three towards two or three. the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the World Media Group is an alliance of leading international media organisations that connects brands with highly engaged, influential audiences in the context of trusted and renowned journalism. I'm delighted to have as members the Atlantic, BBC News Global, Bloomberg Media, Business Insider, The Economist, Forbes, Fortune, Financial Times, National Geographic, New York Times, Reuters, Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. It is a great honor to work with all of them. Thank you.